Hey everybody, Jim from Slick Audio, talking today about performance of computers and how do I size my computer? How do you size your computer? Um, three major components that we're going to deal with. So excluding SSDs, hard drives, we're going to talk about three major components. Number one, CPU. Number two, memory. Number three, video card. Eh, why not? Let's start with the video card. It's real simple. Video card means nothing, for the most part, doing audio, for the most part. Our base card guys will do four 4K monitors. It, that's why I'm saying, yeah, it may, may, may matter in somebody else's computer, not ours. If you're getting into video production, that's where the game changes. So the base card is capable of doing video production without a problem. But performance, in particular rendering times, that's where you're going to feel the pain, if you will. It's going to be slower on, on that base video card. So as you move up the chain, you're basically taking rendering times and, of course, towards the end, the number of monitors, uh, you know, up to potential six uh, with just a single card. So that's it for video cards. That's all it's doing for you. It's doing nothing for audio. Now, let's move to the two, the two monsters, right? We have CPU and memory. I hear this all the time, and it drives me insane. I need more cores. If you want cores, go to the damn beer store and buy some cores. Uh, and, and if you don't want as many, you can call it Cores Light. Oh, that was rough. That was rough. A anywho, barring the, the stupid pun that I just gave and, and a half-assed joke at that, the number of cores doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to have a better performing computer. So here's the deal. Heat. If I took, let's just say back in the old days, right, when we had one, one core, one processor, it was it, you had one. Let's just say I took eight of those and, and put them right next to each other all together. Now again, let's go, we're going, we're going way back, all right, way back. If I put them all next to each other and actually tried to run something, again, this is all hypothetical, I'd end up with a ball of heat there that would be so hot, the middle processors would most likely start to melt. And, and even if they didn't melt, it would probably fail. It, it would be a matter of seconds, minutes, maybe a couple hours. It ain't going to last days. And, and that, they would fail, you know, from, from uh, thermal failure. So, why is that? Well, the more I put together, the more heat I generate. The more cores I put on a die, on a CPU, the more stinking heat I'm going to generate. So, you have two sides of the equation. Side one says, I want more cores. Well, all right, well, I can't run it as fast then. Okay, I'll take less cores. Now I can run it faster. Which is going to be faster for audio? Well, that all depends. <laughs> so, another fork in the road. But th this, is a, this is a very critical point, so pay attention to this, please. So, if you do a lot of tracks and a lot of plugins, I would absolutely agree and say, the more cores. I'm not going to say more cores the better, but more cores will give you an advantage. How does that sound? That's probably a little clearer. If I'm running a lot of VSTIs, virtual instruments, I'd rather have the performance because they can only use one core out of that CPU. One. Now, I'm going to talk another thing about performance towards the end. I'm going to defer this because I want to touch on memory before I get into that. So, cores versus less versus speed of each core, right? So the more cores you have, the slower we got to take it. That doesn't mean it's going to be a slower box. It could be just as fast. It could be faster. It depends on your use and your application. Not mine, not the boxes, not the boxes fault, not my fault. And it's not your fault either. It's, but it's how you're using it. So general rule of thumb, if you do a lot of tracks and want a lot of Plugins per track, more cores. Absolutely. If that is not as important as running absolute, perfect, real-time VSDIs, virtual instruments, then go with the speed. I'd rather see you, you get an eight-core machine, you know, or, or whatever, a lesser-core machine, and we crank the speed up to all oh, get out. You're going to have an amazing performing machine, I promise you. So that's the rule of thumb. Now let's just talk about memory in conjunction with all that crap, right? 16 gig of RAM, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
not really. <laughs> Doing a couple of tracks, like 10 less, fine. Over that, get real. 32 gigs should be your starting point, period, the end. It just should be. Again, right, it's based on your application, not mine, your application. So 32 gigs kind of the base point. You can do, I'd say, again, this is rough, guys, right? Because depending on the number of plugins, the type of plugins, all this stuff, 32 gig of RAM could probably do anywhere from 30 to 50 tracks fairly well. Um, if you start getting into like convolution reverbs and stuff that's, you know, a lot of IRs and your plugins, uh, impulse responses, you're going to end up with problems, you know, and then it's going to want get a little hungry. So 64 gig, major sweet spot. It is the sweet spot. If you have the money, do 64 gig out of the box. You, you won't regret it. And few people out there are ever going to use more than that. I'm not saying nobody will. I have 128 in my own machine. And I've pegged it a couple of times. But the bottom line is, is most of the stuff that you're going to do, 64 gig is plenty. And I mean really plenty. So we covered number of cores versus the speed in the CPU. We've covered memory in a very general sense. We've covered video card. Now I'm going to go back to VSTIs and the processor memory thing in general. And this is what I was deferring from earlier in the conversation. So when you record a VSTI, right? It's a MIDI track, right? You're recording MIDI and it's playing back through a virtual instrument. Real instrument, virtual instrument. That's awesome. When you have what you want, freeze the virtual instrument. You don't have to, to delete it, just freeze it. By freezing it, you're basically offloading all the extra BS and freeing up memory and freeing up some processing power. Um, but you're freeing up disk, you know, disk pull, you're freeing up a lot of stuff when you do that. Freeze the damn track. When you are fully comfortable with that track, and you're ready to just mishmash all pile more on, again, depending on the size of your machine, print it down. Print it down to a WAV file, get it on there, and then unload the VSTI altogether. Once the track's there, the track's there. If you're perfectly happy with it, you're not deleting the MIDI. If you're smart, you're going to save the VSTI, you're going to save the, the actual preset that you recorded. You can recall it if you want to, but you're gaining the most performance because you don't have to do anything. It's a raw audio track and it just it's going to take virtually no horsepower to run in the grand scheme, right? So if you want to do a crap load of tracks, you know, you, at some point in time you may have to start getting into that printing the track or at least worst case freezing the track. You should, not even worst case, best case freezing the track. Freeze the damn track! Doesn't take, but, you know, a mouse click and you wait two seconds. Done. Okay, track's frozen. Now move on to your next one. You will get a lot more performance and a lot more bang for your buck doing that than just about anything else. Second and last thing I'm going to talk about with performance is people's use of compression uh, and reverb and delay. So, generally, when we have, again, this is general, and it's rule of thumb. There, there, believe me, I could give you a thousand use cases, probably, or definitely a hundred, in the course of this conversation only. I don't want to put you to sleep. I don't want to put myself to sleep, or my cats to sleep, for goodness sakes, or Chris to sleep, you know. <laughs> so the last piece I'm going to talk about is how we are going to use plugins on certain tracks. So a lot of people will take and put a compressor on every single track. Now, for like drums, you know, your snare... You know, your kick drum, that sort of thing, Tom. Yeah, you, you, you want some very unique equalization and compression, that sort of thing there. I'm talking about more of the overall feel of the song, right? Maybe a better uh, analogy would be reverb. Reverb is something that you're going to want on, you know, on your primary vocal. You're going to want some probably on your uh, background vocals, etc. And maybe a little touch of here or there, depending on where you want to space it in the mix, how deep you want to put it back in the mix. Um, you want to put that in a bus. So basically, think about this. You, you, this is one simple way to do it, way I like to do it. I create a group track, um, you know, or the master, but I, you typically will create a group track, and I'll say, let's just say I want, let's talk about that reverb for vocals, right? And I want to push all my vocals through that particular uh, plug-in. I just happen to like it. Altiverb, actually, is my favorite for that. 
So I'll put out the verb on one track on one bus, right? That stereo bus in in the uh, on that group track. Then what I'll do is I'll assign various tracks to that particular bus. Now caveat: what you get is what you get because I've got one instance of that plugin. The amount of reverb I dial up. Remember I was talking about space and different vocals back. You can't do that that way. All right. So if you can't space anything back at all doing that, it's one reverb and everybody shares it. All right. Well, it's a cheap, easy, quick way to do it, right? Eh, I want to get a feel for it. What does it sound like? All right. It's nice. Group tracks, by the way, are still very valuable for a myriad of other things, and including saving horsepower. There's a reason why I'm going after this, and it's all about the amount of performance, right? So. If you create, you want to bring all the effects in on the bus, and then if you bring it on the bus individually per track, and but you still have one instance of the plugin as opposed to dropping it in an insert, right? So we have bus, right, return send, or we have an insert. An insert means I have one plugin and I put it on one track, and it's inserted into that track. So signal comes, you know. It, virtually out of the track, if you will. It's really coming into the track. Goes into the reverb, comes out of the reverb, back into the track again, right? So that's what I meant by out of the track. So it's inserted in a loop. It's inserted in a serial connection, if you will. So that is an insert. I can put that insert on that group track, which is how you would have to do that. Or you could also do it on the stereo bus. Could. I'd rather do it on a group track, whatever. Your choice. And then you're going to add that as what they call a send. So basically, the signal is being fed through that reverb, right? But I may not want all the reverb brought back. Now, the time of the reverb is going to be the same across the board. Uh, you know, my, my pre-delays, all the other fun stuff that, that comes with that. Um, you know, all the parameters, if you will, the reverb. So I get the same basic reverb, so I have the same basic feel, so everybody's singing in the same room, right? Uh, or concert hall, or whatever, Red Rock, I don't know, whatever feel that you want. And then I can space it in the back a little bit more by having maybe the background vocals have a little bit more reverb than that front vocal. I want the front vocal to be up front. I want the background vocals to be out back, you know, a little bit. So you, you have a sense of three-dimensional, right? Lead singers typically in the front, your background singers are background singers. So that's what I'm trying to get at. So if you consolidate those heavy-duty reverb plugins, you know, like an Alta Verb or any convolution reverb, which sound amazing, you know, that's how you could do it. It's it's real simple to, to get away with that. So what is it doing? Is you're conserving memory and you're conserving CPU cycles. So that is a real simple and foolproof way to get the most out of your entire projects and mixes is to do that consolidation using sends, not necessarily inserts. If you need to do an insert, you need to do an insert. It is what it is. That's project-based. But just so you're aware, you can save horsepower, which could save you money on the machine when you buy it, if you can deal with it and that's your workflow or, or you want to learn how to do that workflow. That's going to be all I'm going to talk about. That was a lot to take in. Watch it a second time if you need to. But bottom line is there's a ton of ways that you could save money on processing power if you size it right for your projects and your style of what you're doing. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day and we'll talk to you in the next video. Cheers.